Well, it's funny you should say the elephant in the room being gold because my article that I just wrote today is called The Gigantic Elf, Pink Elf in the Room, except I'm talking about surging interest rates, not gold. But, you know, what's going on with gold? Generally speaking, what's going on with everything? It's the, the greatest dislocation of asset class movements and correlations in the 28 years I've been watching financial markets. It's the product of, uh, as I called it a few weeks ago, peak uh, manipulation, idiocy, hubris, or I actually called it a idiocy, manipulation, hubris, conflagration. Uh, that's what's going on right now. In some ways, you have crazy rigging of markets. You also have crazy expectations. You have people completely not understanding the ramifications of, for instance, surging um, interest rate yields and, and a dollar, which are you know catastrophic for a global economy that's already on the edge. And then, of course, as you said, you have plunging oil, oil. Uh, excuse me, uh, gold prices. Uh, which when it, when it comes to gold, look, there's no market that's more rigged on the planet. But, uh, you know, you obviously it's not just that it's not. I mean, there are definitely people that have beliefs out there. But what is the belief is the belief that we're going to have deflation, you know, like Harry Dent likes to say, well, surging interest rates uh, around the world would tell you otherwise surging base metal prices. I mean, we're having a parabolic explosion in copper and zinc and lead because of the explosive inflationary expectations of Trump's uh, fiscal policies, uh, let alone his protectionist uh, trade policies. So it's certainly not due to deflation, uh, even though, of course, gold has been the best performer during deflationary periods ever, uh, going from 2008 to the Great Depression to every market decline we've had in the, in the past, who knows, five, ten years. Uh, is gold falling because of inflation expectations? Well, that would make no sense. Uh, since gold is historically been the best protection against inflation that you're going to find, uh, you know, and then some people say, well, it's because uh, it's fear mongers because India is going to ban gold. Well, no, actually, India said we're absolutely not going to ban gold. They're just talking about cash. And for anyone who actually believes they're going to do that, I, I wrote yesterday that, you know, first of all, there's 500,000 Indians employed in the gold bullion and gems jewelry trade. And it's 7% of Indian GDP. So when you're talking about an economy that's already plunging, I mean, we're talking about they've just halved expectations of growth there just because of what's happened in the aftermath of the of the, the currency ban. Plus, the rupee is now uh, just about at its all-time low against the dollar. So, you know, now you think that they're going to try to take gold away from the people, which they've said they're not going to. I mean, that would be, I said, it would be like the Bolshevik Revolution and the French Revolution combined the social backlash of trying to do something like that. So why? I think it's because for the most part, the rigging is historic. And we've had historic, quote, commercial short positions on the COMEX all year, essentially. I mean, it's been, they've been, uh, you know, net, net short, the, only these two commodities for 15 years. And now they're more net short than they've ever been before, uh, which doesn't mean the price is going lower than it is now. It simply means that they are more scared of the the ramifications of all this money printing and look at look at the ramifications I and mean, we have higher debt than we've ever had it's parabolically exploding we have crashing currencies the world around i mean most currencies are at or near in most cases well below previous all-time lows the level of global trade is the lowest it's probably been in our lifetimes and now that you know it's so funny people try to get excited about oh the dow is up since the election yeah but bond markets have lost a lot more than stock markets have gained and just just the the impact on the global economy of this one month of, of exploding interest rates and uh, and plunging currencies is going to be massive. So, again, biggest dislocation of all asset classes that I've ever seen. Uh, and I've seen a lot. So, you know, how do I think it'll end? I think it'll end the way it always ends with uh, with tears and with money printing. So you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned interest rates. You mentioned India currency. Let's just go with interest rates right now. Now, the Fed during this whole year said they were going to increase the interest rates here. They're going to they're going to, you know, take them and not go negative. They're going to bring them up. And so far, they have done nothing. Now, last year, around this time period, this is when they raised the interest rates. Do you think the Fed at this point is going to raise the interest rates in December? Because if not, don't they lose all credibility? <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that because my audio blog Monday was called Preserving Credibility When None Exists, referring to uh, the FOMC minutes from their last meeting when it said several governors say we need to raise rates in, in December to preserve credibility. And again, you know, will they raise rates? First of all, 
now and a year ago are, you know, we're talking about two different planets as far as, you know, the, the environment that we're in. But yeah, I mean, the Fed has spent, it's now all, almost four years of claiming that they're going to tighten monetary policy. And what do we have for the four years? One measly quarter point interest rate increase and an all time high balance sheet. And they're still monetizing. I mean, they still reinvest all the proceeds of, uh, of, of maturing bonds. So they, that their, their $4.5 trillion balance sheet, not including who knows what off balance sheet is the same as it was at the peak at, as when they quote stopped tapering. And of course, uh, stopped QE. And of course they didn't stop doing that because we've now seen what 400 billion dollars worth of treasury bond sales from foreign countries that need cash. And yet until very recently, the bond yields were, were, weren't going down at all. Of course they've been monetizing and they have plenty of stuff off balance sheet and all kinds of swaps. So, look, the Fed has been talking about doing this forever. This year, they said they were going to raise rates four times. <clears throat> I mean, they did it last year one time, again, only to, quote, preserve credibility because they had said all year they're going to raise rates. And then when they did it, they almost blew up the world. Uh, and here we are a year later where the world is far worse. I mean, trade is far worse than it was. Currencies are far lower than they were. Most commodities, uh, well, some commodities are all disjointed all over the place. Are, are much lower, some are higher, depending on uh, the, the various markets and manipulations. But the fact is, the world is a much more dangerous place, especially with all these political changes, the Brexit, the Trump, next week, the Italian referendum, uh, the upcoming French referendum. So again, you know, we're talking about much higher political and economic risks and monetary risks than we've ever had before. And here we are again, the Fed said they were going to raise rates four times this year. And as we get to the end of the year, they haven't done it yet. And, you know, they've been talking it up. Because, again, if they have high, all they care about is the stock market. If they think that they can get away with it by goosing the stock market, they'll do it. The problem is that they've now they've now been pinned into the corner, not but not so much by their own words, but by the market itself, because the bond vigilantes, which have been, you know, dead for for decades now uh, because of all the QE and uh, until recently, the, the rising inflationary uh, the deflationary trends, uh, they're awake now. And so they have taken the 10 year yield from what, 170 before the election to 240 today. So that's 70 basis point increase just in the past month or so in, in interest rates. And they're going to, yeah, they're going to have to raise rates by 25 basis points, but that's not preserving credibility because that's staying way behind the curve. The point is, you know, they need to cut off inflation while, you know, when the inflation expectations are rising, but they can't do it because we have record debt. The Fed has record debt. Donald Trump, Mr. Debt King, holding high end real estate properties on leverage, uh, who just, you know, hired a, a Goldman Sachs guy to be Treasury Secretary yesterday. He needs lower rates. So, again, the Fed's going to have to tiptoe because, of course, they have to raise rates now because there's 100 percent expectation and because the bond vigilantes have done it for them. But, you know, what really matters is what they're going to say afterward, because what they need to do is raise them by 75 basis points, like like the bond vigilantes have done for them. But if they do, that would collapse the markets. So they're going to do 25 basis points and they're going to have to tread very carefully because no matter what they do, they, they risk creating a, a bigger surge in uh, in interest rates uh, on December 14th. So uh, I'm not worried at all about what they do, because if they think they're going to preserve credibility with a 25 point basis hike, they are the ones who are going to be in for a rude awakening in two weeks. So we see already, you mentioned India, and um, we see that, you know, they demonetized their currency. And we see a war on cash going on right now. And we see Norway, Sweden, Australia, now India. Um, I mean, is this going to spread throughout the private Western Central Bank countries? Right. Again, as I said, you know, the actions of these governments is certainly not the actions of governments that are doing well and feel confident. I mean, we're talking about aside from the U.S., pretty much every major central bank is in an active, aggressive easing mode right now with massive QE, negative interest rates. And, you know, we still have interest rates of 25 basis points, on, you know, and we're the we're the conservative ones. So, you know, these are the actions of people fearful. And remember, when we first started throwing out trial balloons of the war on cash, it was back in, you know, February or March when the economy, when the market was falling. I mean, that's what happens. Things get bad and governments do, do uh, you know, react to it. So around the world, they're reacting with negative interest rates, QE, and now the war on cash to the, you know, terrible times. And of course, that all that does is make their currencies crash even further. So what India has done, I mean, it's really, 
It's a unique case because India was 85 or 90 percent cash economy to start with. So they, you know, they think they're going to get more taxes by doing that. But what they're really doing in an economy that really is not digital to start with is really just restricting trade and uh, and making more people into debt serfs. Uh, so it's, you know, it's going to cause it's already caused massive social unrest. It's not going to get any better. And um, and, you know, it's it's just a trend of draconian government control. In the case of India, I called financial apartheid over there because the people hate paper money and they're being forced by a very, very small minority uh, government to be to be using it. And they are destroying it. I mean, the rupees at an all time low as we speak. And the government is uh, shows no qualms and they were just lowering interest rates. And now, look, if they just lowered interest rates uh, a couple of months ago. When when growth expectations were twice as much, what are they going to do now? So the rupee has gotten hit by the cash ban, and now it's going to get hit even more when the Reserve Bank of, Bank of India slaps them in the face by lowering rates more, let alone as this whole global crisis expands and the dollar surges against everything as it's been and, and doubles up on that. So I expect, uh, you know, I wrote an article a few years ago called The World's Worst Government uh, about India, and I expect that, you know, India has been on the top of my list of, uh, you know, of a flashpoint, uh, you know, causing really, really bad ramifications. And now it's more so. And, and believe me, they're not the only ones who are going to be doing these kind of things. So you think the war on cash is going to come here to the United States? Well, it already has to an extent. I mean, less or so. I mean, if you, you know, try to take money out of the bank, right, and see what they say if you try to take large sums. And of course, we've had no interest rates at our at our banks for for the longest amount of time and no one makes money and you lose it to inflation but you know we do have the quote reserve currency so we have the ability to to destroy our currency uh you know to print more currency than other countries without destroying it as rapidly so we've been able to get away with not doing some of the more draconian things to date uh but you know in time you know the cancer spreads from the limbs up to the to the head which is what the the u.s dollar is and you know, of course, you know, I mean, when people like Larry Summers are, you know, are out there constantly talking about uh, these things, they're, they're trial balloons. And now that it looks like uh, not that it matters, but Trump is surrounding himself with the same kind of, you know, people that everyone else had around him are, are like Barack Obama. So, you know, as soon as there's the first crisis, you know, you can bet the war on cash and and, uh, and and draconian Federal Reserve actions and you know, all these crazy government actions related to capital controls and fiscal stimulus and are only going to increase. You know, ever since uh, the election and Trump was elected president, we've seen many of the statistical information about our economy, like, increase incredibly. I mean, of course, the stock market rose to all new heights. GDP was revised to 32 before the election, unemployment came down to 4.9. I mean, everything on paper makes it seem like the economy is fantastic. Is there a reason why they're doing this? Well, yeah, I mean, it's called can kicking. And we have the best uh, rigors of markets and economic data ever. I mean, when it comes to unemployment data, I mean, I'm not the only one that you've had on this show uh, who's who's broken it down. You can look at the last one or two reports. It's the same thing. You know, labor participation rate uh, basically at a four or five decade low Real wages at a multi-decade low. The kind of jobs that are there, they're mostly minimum wage paying. Like here, yeah, today, the ADP report, much better than expected. Problem was manufacturing jobs were down while all these part-time service jobs uh, were up. And again, people forget, or I've been reminding them a lot, in the four months leading up to the election, the government increased their national debt by four, uh, $475 billion dollars. Uh, obviously, they were trying to get Hillary in office and, and to preserve Obama's legacy. And so, you know, it creates jobs, not good jobs, uh, but it, you can goose data that way. And then, you know, but you, you still look at most of the other real data, durable goods, factory orders, retail sales, they've all been horrible. Look at the beginning of the Black Friday, right? We're being told how great things are. The beginning of the Black Friday weekend was abysmal. I mean, beyond abysmal, way below last year's numbers. And as for the third quarter GDP number, I'm still scratching on my head how how even their statistical numbers could show up three percent because throughout the entire quarter, even with all this debt, all the real numbers were down. I mean, inventories didn't even go up during the quarter. 
retail sales, all these factory good orders and stuff, they were all negative. Uh, so how did they come up with 3% GDP growth? Again, it's a statistical fabrication. And, uh, you know, now you're seeing in the wake of the election things like consumer confidence surge and PMIs surge because confidence surge because Trump is there. But that's not business activity. That's confidence, which uh, is very fleeting. And it's not really based on anything. So, I mean, yeah, I'm more confident in America that Hillary Clinton is not president, but that doesn't make my my financial situation change. It doesn't make me I'm not out there buying more things. And, I, and certainly if the retail sales over the Black Friday weekend were any uh, indication. The rest of the people aren't doing that either. So, again, you know, we're in this, quote, honeymoon period. I'm not sure what the honeymoon is because. You know, Trump has uh, promised what every other politician has promised. And and the only problem is that we have much more debt than we've ever had before. Now interest rates are surging and the dollar is surging, which are extremely deleterious to any ability to do these things. I mean, if you want to fund, fund a five trillion dollar stimulus plan with rising interest rates when you already have a record amount of debt, uh, I doubt you're going to be able to get anything done on that front. And even if you did, they'd be unproductive jobs. I mean, building the military and roads and bridges, yeah, it builds GDP numbers, but it doesn't actually produce anything. So it, in the in the big picture, it just adds more debt. And when you're already at basically peak debt and it's going parabolic, that's not going to help you. It's going to simply create more inflation, which is why interest rates are surging right now, which in turn makes everything less valuable and, and you know, causes the dollar to hurt. I mean, it's a vicious loop. So again, people, don't worry. Don't worry about the precious metals. They are, you know, right now we're getting, we're getting to the point where they're going to start talking about the miners being in trouble again. You know, there's a, a dollar 60 per ounce, 1.60 ounce spread between U.S. and Chinese silver prices. And it's been going on for the past two weeks. So you're going to see this physical dislocation like we always see. So, and as far as Record stock prices. Well, guess what? The bond losses around the world have been far bigger than the stock gains. And I think you're going to see the impact of those those huge uh, interest rate increases uh, on the global economy in the very, very near future, let alone when these, you know, if the Italian referendum, if it's going to fail this weekend and you're going to be going into another Brexit like situation in Europe. You know, with all this statistical information, I, I think it has to do with Obama than more than Trump, because uh, Obama didn't have uh, one quarter of GDP over 3%. And to me, I don't think he wanted to leave the presidency without having a GDP hit at least 3% or over. What's very interesting in the corporate media, I'm seeing that there's you know stories coming out now saying Obama will be handing off a healthy economy to Trump. Hopefully Trump can keep the engine running or will he drive the car into a ditch? So I feel like they're setting all of this up to show that Obama had this incredible economy. And when Trump gets it, maybe if things go south, they can say Obama had a healthy economy. Trump drove it into the ditch. And look where we are now. Yeah, but well, yeah, well, this is coming from the same mainstream media that's now been dubbed the fake news. I mean, you know, they they were the they were bad. They were bad enough for for how long? I mean, look at the look at the ratings before the election cycle of mainstream media, whether it's financial media like CNBC or the CNNs of the world or even the Fox News is, uh, you know, they've been plummeting for years. No one even listens to them, partly because they have other alternative media, which is exploding like ours and, and the Internet in general, and mostly because these guys are liars. But you know, as for their post-election reaction, I mean, is, is anyone even listening? They're, they're, you know, I mean, there's a reason they're going to say that that Obama left a great economy. I mean, isn't that why, despite all of that rigging, he still lost and he pretty much lost like 90 or Hillary lost like 90 percent of all the counties in America. Of course, he didn't leave a good economy. And as I said, first of all, no one even is looking at GDP numbers or believes him. And I look at them and I'm going, I can't even figure out how they could have fabricated Three percent from like every month you'd have to, durable goods orders down one percent, down two percent, down point three percent, and all these numbers. And then they come out and say the economy grew three percent, and and the unemployment rate just got to four point nine percent just before he left, despite the record low labor participation rate and the and all these minimum wage jobs that they're counting, uh, you know, a double and triple in the numbers, lowest home ownership you've had in in decades. I mean, all these kind of things, the highest food stamp usage. Uh, yeah, no, no one's listening to that stuff. They voted in Trump because the economy was so bad. And, uh, you know, trying to the, no one's even listening to him. Are they going to try to they'll always try to pin stuff in him. The media is liberal. They hate him. 
And uh, if he succeeds wildly and we have a utopia like Star Trek, they'll still say he's ruining the world and we need uh, we need more Democrats. But I wouldn't worry about the media or Trump. He's going to go his own way. He's going to run into the same obstacles everyone else ha- has run into, uh, although at least he's a you know, he's a businessman who has some some understanding of what's going on in the world. But again, it's too big for him or any single man or woman to handle. The problems are just too big and they have to be unwound. Uh, do you think Trump is uh, now in office because he is the master of bankruptcies? I mean, as we've been talking for a very long time, the economy is deteriorating, collapsing, and he knows how to handle bankruptcies. He knows how to handle uh, businesses that are going down. Do you think that's one of the reasons why he is there right now? No, I think handle? he's there. I think he's there because he's not because uh, he's not uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. He was he's the most gifted. Uh, of the candidates that came out from the Republican side. He's not even a Republican. And so, you know, he won because he's charismatic and he's a, a smart guy. But again, he, he, you know, I've said a million times, I mean, it could be Jesus Christ or Superman right now. They're not going to all of a sudden make the debt go away. And certainly not with a multi trillion dollar fiscal stimulus plan fit, financed by nothing but money printing and debt and, tr- and protectionist trade policies, which will only make things worse. I mean, he's got to deal with it. And, you know, managing the bankruptcy of a, of a of a small corporation compared to the the reserve currency issuer and all of the other countries around the world are two different things. I mean, you know, if he if he even admits, I mean, he even talked about restructuring the U.S.'s debt at one point, which is absolutely ridiculous. You make a comment like that now, and the dollar will crash, or more importantly, Treasury bonds will crash. Um, so no, he's he's only there because he's the the new populist candidate. He offers. A lot more than what Hillary Clinton offered. And, um, you know, at this point, you know, he's just going to, you know, he's in the honeymoon where he's just building his cabinet and hasn't had to deal with the problems yet. And I assure you, it won't be long before he has to deal just with the ramifications of what interest rates have done in the last month alone. So what do you see happening in 2017? Do you see the economy deteriorating further? I mean, how could it not? I mean, we're, we're talking about this was the worst global economy of our lifetimes this year. Uh, and now the debt is going up parabolically, and now you have crashing currencies around the world, and interest rates are surging. How can it get better? We have overcapacity everywhere. That's why OPEC is meeting and making up. I mean, God, you see this agreement today? It's worse than the one back in Algiers. It, you, we have no details. Uh, they kicked o- o- Indonesia out, so probably the, you know they're, they're going to produce more than they than than they say. They, it's contingent on Russia and other countries and saying that they're going to cut production. I mean, the whole thing is it's just all these guys, they're just desperate, desperate to, to you know, to, to change the fact, uh, you know, to reverse the fact that we have historic oversupply where we don't need it and historic undersupply where we do need it. Do you think in 2017, do you think the economy is going to crash under Trump? It's nothing to do with Trump. I think it's going to get worse. I mean, you know, it's it's hard I hate to make big predictions. Uh, you know, I mean, look, the, in many ways, the global economy has crashed. I mean, look at the Chinese and Japanese export numbers. I mean, is that not or Korean? Does that not count as a crash? I mean, it's uh, look at their currencies, not just those, but everyone's currencies. Most of the con- countries in the world will tell you that their economy is in collapse right now, which is why you're seeing all these votes everywhere uh, to vote everybody out. Uh, but again, Higher interest rates in a world which was already in its worst condition, economy is worst condition of our lifetime, is the key, is the big, well, look, the only thing that's been keeping us from oblivion for all these years has been the ultra low interest rates. And now they're surging. I and mean, that's, as I said today, the giant pink elephant in the room. No one wants to look at the fact that that when you have record high debt, record high interest or surging interest rates is the worst imaginable uh, outcome. So you have that. And then, you know, no one wants to look at that one talks about the the surging dollar, but you know the the dollar surging is a is the worst imaginable thing for U.S. corporate earnings, and it's certainly not going to help the rest of the world because they need to pay back all their debts in U.S. dollars. So yes, I think 2017 the global economy will be much worse, and you're going to throw in all these sweeping political changes. Uh, there's going to be populist movements. There's going to be more money printing. There's going to be uh, trade wars and all kinds of things. So I expect 2017 to be uh, a time where finally. The powers that be have trouble controlling what they've been so masterfully keeping their hands on for so long. Jim Rickards has been talking about a uh, new currency, the SDR, replacing the dollar on the global stage. Do you, do you see a new currency being ushered in? 
Uh, well, I mean, that's his thing. He's trying to he's trying to get readers. I mean, he's a smart guy, but this SDR thing is so ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I've said for years, you're going to take all, all these crashing currencies that no one wants any part of, let alone the euro, which may not even be around, and say, well, if we just put them together onto a new balance sheet, everyone will accept them and, and we can uh, borrow as much money as we want in it and hand it out. I mean, it's just so ridiculous to believe that we could get th that far with that SDR, where the IMF, which is already discredited in, in every way, is somehow going to uh, be a major <laughs> be a major factor in the world. I don't believe it for a second. I think if, if you get to that point, at least Rickards and I believe that gold will surge. But I don't. It's not even worth talking about. I think the whole idea is so silly. Do you think the U.S. dollar is going to continue to be the reserve currency, or do you think there's another country out there that will take control of the currency around the world? I think the U.S. dollar ha has to stay the reserve currency because the system is is crashing right now, and uh, and uh, the you know the only way that we're going to start over is with a new system, not with a new currency. Ultimately, China is going to be the leader because they have the most manufacturing capacity and the most gold, but they themselves have a crash to go through because they have an historic economic bubble, and uh, and you know b before that plays out. Uh, you know, before we get to the point where any new currency can be established, which I assure you will not be one based on fiat, uh, you know, we have to go through a painful crash. So I wouldn't even worry about the future. Frankly, I think cryptocurrency would be the future because no one ever is going to trust a government to issue anything. This reset that you just talked about going through the pain, like what kind of pain are you talking about? Well, you know, the average person's been feeling a lot, which is why they've been voting in people like Trump and voting for the Brexit and, and that kind of stuff. And we have... I just read that 70% of Americans have uh, less than a thousand dollars of savings, and I'm sure it's not much better around the world. So I think in a world where jobs, real jobs, have been scarce and savings scarcer, uh, at a time when you're going to see uh, resetting interest rates higher and uh, and weaker currencies the world around, I think people are going to, you know, feel the the pain of a real recession, not you know, not one that can be for the millionth time put off by money printing and you know, I don't want to know what that maybe it feels like 2008. Uh, maybe it feels uh, like something worse or something better. But, you know, the net result is going to be the repudiation of trillions of dollars of debt. I mean, that's how it has to end. And uh, if it's going to be done by money printing, which is how it usually is, it's going to be inflation uh, that does it. If not, it's going to be due to, uh, you know, a, a deflation. But I would I would bet it's a little of both. And, um, you know, and I think that what you're seeing in places like Venezuela right now is uh, is not a not a preview necessarily for the entire world, but it's the direction that we're heading because, I mean, look, interest rates are surging right now. How do you think all the debt that's that's resetting to higher interest rates is going to get paid back and reissued? It's going to be at higher rates that needs to be monetized. So I think people need to prepare for a worst case scenario because I truly believe and have for some time that that's the the only way. I mean, they put off what should have happened years ago uh, with the printing press. And right now we're getting to the point of no return. You're seeing it politically and eventually you're going to see it in the in the financial markets, uh, you know, because at some point you can't control everything. When we go through all this, do you think the central bank will exist after all of this is said and done? I do not. I, I, it's the system that's the problem. It's the system, you know, we talk about preserving credibility when none exists. I mean, who's even who's listening to the media anymore? Who's listening to the central bankers? Like, aside from the you know the PPT that's out there trying to manage expectations and a couple of hangers-on traders, do you think anyone's listening to the Fed anymore, telling us how great the economy is, or, or let alone these other ones? How about the ECB, where the entire Europe is falling apart because, and that's after you know four years after Draghi said he'd do whatever it takes to save Europe. So again, no, I believe the system is the problem. It's the money, it's the bad fiat money, and that's all it's the root of pretty much all the problems. That and probably overpopulation of the world today. So I think that, you know, I'm not talking about that's gonna happen in 2017, but it's certainly the trend of where we're going. And and you know, maybe it is 2017 where it all hits the fan. Andy, thank you for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Again, Miles Franklin Precious Metals, we are finishing our 27th year in business. Uh, we now actually have online purchasing capability uh, as well as the world's best storage programs in Canada. Uh, you can go to milesfranklin.com. You can call me at 800-822-8080 or email me at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. All right. Thank you very much since the election. Yeah, but bond markets have lost a lot more than stock markets have gained. And just 
just the the impact on the global economy of this one month of of exploding interest rates and uh, and plunging currencies is going to be massive. So again, biggest dislocation of all asset classes that I've ever seen, uh, and I've seen a lot. So you know, how do I think it'll end? I think it'll end the way it always ends with uh, with tears and with money printing. So you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned interest rates. You mentioned India currency. Let's just go with interest rates right now. Now, the Fed during this whole year said they were going to increase the interest rates here. They're going to they're going to, you know, take them and not go negative. They're going to bring them up. And so far, they have done nothing. Now, last year, around this time period, this is when they raised the interest rates. Do you think the Fed at this point is going to raise the interest rates in December? Because if not, don't they lose all credibility? <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that because my audio blog Monday was called Preserving Credibility When None Exists, referring to uh, the FOMC minutes from their last meeting when it said several governors say we need to raise rates in, in December to preserve credibility. And again, you know, will they raise rates? First of all, now and a year ago are, you know, we're talking about two different planets as far as, you know, the, the environment that we're in. But yeah, I mean, the Fed has spent it's now uh, almost four years of claiming that they're going to tighten monetary policy. And what do we have for the four years? One measly quarter point interest rate increase and an all time high balance sheet. And they're still monetizing. I mean, they still reinvest all the proceeds of, uh, of, of maturing bonds. So they, that their, their $4.5 trillion balance sheet, not including who knows what off balance sheet is the same as it was at the peak at, as when they pass month or so in, in interest rates. And they're going to, yeah, they're going to have to raise rates by 25 basis points, but that's not preserving credibility because that's staying way behind the curve. The point is, you know, they need to cut off inflation while, you know, when the inflation expectations are rising, but they can't do it because we have record debt. The Fed has record debt. Donald Trump, Mr. Debt King, holding high end real estate properties on leverage, uh, who just, you know, hired a, a Goldman Sachs guy to be Treasury Secretary yesterday. He needs lower rates. So, again, the Fed's going to have to tiptoe because, of course, they have to raise rates now because there's a hundred percent expectation and because the bond vigilantes have done it for them. But you know, what really matters is what they're going to say afterward, because what they need to do is raise them by 75 basis points, like, like the bond vigilantes have done for them. But if they do, that would collapse the markets. So they're going to do 25 basis points and they're going to have to tread very carefully because no matter what they do, they, they risk creating a, a bigger surge in, uh, in interest rates uh, on December 14th. So uh, I'm not worried at all about what they do. Because if they think they're going to preserve credibility with a 25 point basis hike, they are the ones who are going to be in for a rude awakening in two weeks. So we see already you mentioned India and um, we see that, you know, they demonetized their currency and we see a war on cash going on right now. And we see Norway, Sweden, Australia, now India. Um, I mean, is this going to spread throughout the private Western Central Bank countries? Right. Again, as I said, you know, the actions of these governments is certainly not the actions of governments that are doing well and feel confident. I mean, we're talking about aside from the U.S., pretty much every major central bank is in an active, aggressive easing mode right now. Well, it's funny you should say the elephant in the room being gold because my article that I just wrote today is called the gigantic elf, pink elephant in the room, except I'm talking about surging interest rates, not gold. But, you know, what's going on with gold? Generally speaking, what's going on with everything? It's the, the greatest dislocation of asset class movements and correlations in the 28 years I've been watching financial markets. It's the product of, uh, as I called it a few weeks ago, peak uh, manipulation, idiocy, hubris, or I actually called it a idiocy, manipulation, hubris, conflagration. Uh, that's what's going on right now. In some ways, you have crazy rigging of markets. You also have crazy expectations. You have people completely not understanding the ramifications of, for instance, surging um, interest rate yields and, and a dollar, which are you know catastrophic for a global economy that's already on the edge. And then, of course, as you said, you have plunging oil, oil. Uh, excuse me, uh, gold prices, uh, which when it, when it comes to gold, look, there's no market that's more rigged on the planet. But, uh, you know, you obviously it's not just that it's not. I mean, there are definitely people that have beliefs out there. But what is the belief? Is the belief that we're going to have deflation, you know, like Harry Dent likes to say? Well, surging interest rates uh, around the world would tell you otherwise. Surging base metal prices. I mean, we're having a parabolic explosion in copper and zinc and lead. 
because of the explosive inflationary expectations of Trump's uh, fiscal policies, uh, let alone his protectionist uh, trade policies. So it's certainly not due to deflation, uh, even though, of course, Gold has been the best performer during deflationary periods ever, uh, going from 2008 to the Great Depression to every market decline we've had in the in the past, who knows, five, ten years, uh, is, quote, stop tapering. And, of course, uh, stop QE. And, of course, they didn't stop doing that because we've now seen, what, $400 billion worth of Treasury bond sales from foreign countries that need cash. And yet, until very recently, the bond yields were, were, weren't going down at all. Of course, they've been monetizing and they have plenty of stuff off balance sheet and all kinds of swaps. So, look, the Fed has been talking about doing this forever. This year, they said they were going to raise rates four times. <clears throat> I mean, they did it last year one time, again, only to, quote, preserve credibility because they had said all year they're going to raise rates. And then when they did it, they almost blew up the world. Uh, and here we are a year later where the world is far worse. I mean, trade is far worse than it was. Currencies are far lower than they were. Most commodities, uh, well, some commodities are all disjointed all over the place. Are, are much lower, some are higher, depending on uh, the, the various markets and manipulations. But the fact is, the world is a much more dangerous place, especially with all these political changes, the Brexit, the Trump, next week, the Italian referendum, uh, the upcoming French referendum. So again, you know, we're talking about much higher political and economic risks and monetary risks than we've ever had before. And here we are again, the Fed said they were going to raise rates four times this year. And as we get to the end of the year, they haven't done it yet. And, you know, they've been talking it up. Because, again, if they have high, all they care about is the stock market. If they think that they can get away with it by goosing the stock market, they'll do it. The problem is that they've now they've now been pinned into the corner, not but not so much by their own words, but by the market itself. Because the bond vigilantes, which have been, you know, dead for for decades now uh, because of all the QE and uh, until recently, the, the rising inflationary uh, the deflationary trends, uh, they're awake now. And so they have taken the 10 year yield from what, 170 before the election to 240 today. So that's 70 basis point increase just in the gold falling because of inflation expectations. Well, that would make no sense uh, since gold is historically been the best protection against inflation that you're going to find. Uh, you know, and then some people say, well, it's because uh, it's fear mongers because India is going to ban gold. Well, no, actually, India said we're absolutely not going to ban gold. They're just talking about cash. And for anyone who actually believes they're going to do that, I, I wrote yesterday that, you know, first of all, there's 500,000 Indians employed in the gold, bullion and gems, jewelry trade, and it's 7% of Indian GDP. So when you're talking about an economy that's already plunging, I mean, we're talking about they've just halved expectations of growth there just because of what's happened in the aftermath of the of the, the currency ban. Plus, the rupee is now uh, just about at its all time low against the dollar. So, you know, now you think that they're going to try to take gold away from the people, which they've said they're not going to. I mean, that would be I said it would be like the Bolshevik Revolution and the French Revolution combined the social backlash of trying to do something like that. So why? I think it's because for the most part, the rigging is historic and we've had historic, quote, commercial short positions on the COMEX all year, essentially. I mean, it's been, they've been, uh, you know, net, net short, the, only these two commodities for 15 years, and now they're more net short than they've ever been before, uh, which doesn't mean the price is going lower than it is now. It simply means that they are more scared of the the ramifications of all this money printing. And look at, look at the ramifications. I mean, we have higher debt than we've ever had. It's parabolically exploding. We have crashing currencies the world around. I mean, most currencies are at or near, in most cases, well below previous all-time lows. The level of global trade is the lowest it's probably been in our lifetimes. And now that, you know, it's so funny, people try to get excited about, oh, the Dow is up.